Hello and welcome back to Pancast. In today's episode, we will talk about detecting brute force attacks with Palo Alto Network's firewalls. Jitu joins us again to talk about this. Before we start, Jitu, could you remind our listeners about yourself? Hi, John. Glad to be back. I'm a principal cybersecurity specialist in the threat team and have been with Palo Alto Networks for about seven and a half years now. Our team mainly deals with issues associated with the threat prevention features of Palo Alto Networks firewall. Thanks, Jitu. So to start with, what is a brute force attack? A brute force attack uses a large volume of requests and responses to break into a system. The attacker employs a trial and error method to get the response to a challenge or a request. One of the basic examples for a brute force attack is the attacker attempting multiple passwords against a user account with the hopes of guessing the correct password. This is called the dictionary attack. It's automated and attackers use a list of commonly used words, phrases, and number combinations to guess the password. Great. So what coverage do we have in Palo Alto Network's firewalls? Brute force signatures are delivered to the firewall and Prisma Access as a part of content updates and enforced as a part of vulnerability profiles. The firewall includes two types of predefined brute force signatures, which are parent and child signatures. A child signature is a single occurrence of a traffic pattern that matches the signature. A parent signature is associated with a child signature and is triggered when multiple events occur within a specified time interval and that matches the traffic pattern defined in the child signature. I know it can be confusing, but the, but this example should make it clear. So there is a signature called SSH user authentication brute force attempt, and this has a threat ID of 40015. As the name indicates, the high severity signature detects a brute force attack through multiple logging attempts to an SSH server. This is the parent signature and it's related to a child signature, which is threat ID uh, 31914 named SSH2 login attempt, which is an informational level severity signature. The child signature 31914 detects every connection to an SSH server. And if a session has the same source and destination, but triggers our child signature 31914 20 times in 60 seconds, we call it a brute force attack. And this is our default trigger criteria. Typically, the default action for a child signature is allow because a single event is not indicative of an attack. In this case, a single SSH connection is not an indicative of a brute force attack. So this ensures that legitimate traffic is not blocked and avoids generating threat log for non noteworthy events. Palo Alto Networks recommend that you do not change the default action without careful consideration, especially for these informational level signatures. To effectively mitigate an attack, specify the block IP address action instead of the drop or reset action for most brute force signatures. Now you may have a question regarding how to find these default trigger conditions and associated parent and child signature. We have a knowledge base article titled Brute Force Signatures and Related Trigger Conditions that explains exactly this and I'll share this in the transcript. Doing a Google search with the title name will also give you the link to our knowledge base article. I strongly recommend bookmarking this KB. How can we change these default trigger criteria? The default trigger criteria can be modified from exceptions under vulnerability profile. Search for the threat ID first after checking show all signature in the left side bottom and click on the pencil icon next to the signature name to modify the number of hits and number of seconds within which the criteria has to be met. Make sure to uh, check the check mark below enable option to make sure that the modification has been enabled. The important point to note here is that the action configured under exceptions will take precedence over the action configured under rules in the vulnerability protection profile. So make sure that the right action is configured for threat ID under exceptions. I'll also add a link to KB articles for creating exceptions. How do we deal with false positives? Now that we understand the logic behind these signatures, try to assess the situation and understand if it's a false positive. As I mentioned, these default values that we provide could sometimes hit the production traffic for customers if there is a use case in their end that fits the criteria. Always discuss with the relevant teams that manage the associated traffic to confirm the expected traffic criteria and tweak the signature criteria like I mentioned before. If you are not able to confirm that this is a false positive or not, 
the best action is to continue blocking to be on the safe side. You can also open a ticket with all the details so that we can assess the situation as well. Great. Looks like we have strategies to detect and block brute force attacks. Jitu, what would be the key takeaways for today? The key takeaway is to leverage these brute force signatures, understand the logic behind each signature, and harden it as required. Thanks, Jitu. Great info on some of our threat prevention features. You can find the transcript and some valuable links on live.paloaltonetworks.com under Pancast. Thanks again, Jitu. Thank you for having me. Talk to you later. Hope you've learned something today, Pancasters, and remember to subscribe on all popular podcast platforms. Bye for now.